Uh, a few of you are probably wondering what I'm doing up here. Thinking, What's that guy doing up here? Well, I'll tell you what, those same thoughts are running around in my head right now. And I'm not a preacher. I'm very uncomfortable standing and uh, talking in public. It's always been one of my most difficult things to do. But Alan called me up Wednesday and asked if I would preach here Sunday. And I was real reluctant because I had real bad experiences in you know, preaching in the past. But I made a commitment to the Lord that the Lord, I'm not going to volunteer to preach but if somebody ever asked me, I would. So, now here we go. Um, like I say, I'm not a preacher. I know a story. I'd like to tell you the story. This young man went before the church board of his local church and said, God called him to preach. And the church board said, okay, give us an example of your preaching. And uh, he went on and on and on for about an hour just expounding on things. And some of the stuff was just the most off-the-wall stuff you ever saw in your life. So after about an hour, he ran out of steam and quit. The head of the church board said, Young man, how do you know God called you to preach? He said, well, I walked out one morning and I saw the clouds form letters in the sky, and it was G-P-C. Oh, yeah? Well, what's that mean? He said, well, it means go preach Christ. And the older gentleman said, no, son, I don't think. I think it means go get caught. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of my position I'm in right now. <laughs> I really enjoy preaching, but it just, it's not my uh, long suit life. If you turn in your Bible with me to 2 Timothy 3 16 through 17. that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's Timothy. And uh, the author of this book, or one of the authors, uh, was a retired general superintendent of the Nazarene Church. He makes a statement, we believe in the plenary inspiration of the Bible. God speaks to man through his word. I didn't know what plenary meant. So I had to look it up. It literally means absolute. So, according to the Nazarene Church, they believe in uh, total inspiration of all, both the Old and New Testaments. But he makes a statement: it is God's word to man. But it speaks to us. Some some churches say. The Bible contains the Word of God. Well, that means that some of the, the Bible is not the Word of God. No, the Bible is the Word of God. And it's His way of speaking to us, not verbally, but it's still His voice coming through the Bible. You see the red letters in a lot of the red letter editions of the Bible, the words of Jesus? And that's kind of redundant because every word in the Bible is from Jesus. So, we have a duty to study the Bible. When I was a kid, I, I grew up in Sandpoint, and I went to start the first grade at, at uh, Farm and School. School isn't even there anymore, so brick building they tore down. But every morning we had Pledge of Allegiance, we had Bible reading and prayer, all the way up through the fifth grade, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, they quit doing it. And that started the country, I believe, on the road to destruction. The Bible is the Word of God. We're expected to correctly interpret it. And I got a 
got some quotes here in this book here. Exegesis and exposition. That's two words. They're, they're scholarly names for types of study. And this, this commentator says, Bible commentators often use these words to describe two ways of making clear the meaning of a passage in the scriptures. Exegesis is a study of the original Greek or Hebrew words to understand what meanings those words had when they were used by men and women in Bible times. To know the meaning of the separate words as well as the grammatical relationship to each other in one way to understand more clearly what the inspired writer meant to say. The meaning of words today don't necessarily have the same meaning uh, that they did in, in John's time. I picked the book of John because it's my favorite book of the Bible. If you only had one book of the Bible, to know everything about Christ and about theology, it would be the Gospel of John. And we'll get to that in a minute. The second type of uh, study is exposition. is a commentator's effort to point out the meaning of a passage as it is affected by any of several facts known to the writer, but perhaps not familiar to the reader. These facts may be the context that is the surrounding verses or chapters, the historical background, the related teachings from other parts of the Bible, and the significance of these messages from God as they relate to universal facts of human life. God is speaking to us, not only by the Holy Spirit, and without the Holy Spirit, we're, we're uh, totally ignorant. A lot of people know a whole lot about the Bible. Uh, the Jehovah Witness Church just, is just more, probably more knowledgeable than any other uh, um, religious group. But their interpretation is, is off. I attended a Western Evangelical Seminary in uh, 1990 and 91. And we had a guest speaker that came to uh, a meeting, we had what they call Vespers, which was a, a, a time of prayer, and, and we had to go once a week. We had a, a professor, I believe he was from Asbury Theological Seminary, and he's talking to a group of students, everyone working on some type of degree, um, whether Master of Divinity or Master of Arts or whatnot. But he made the statement that if you're going to be a serious student of the New Testament, you have to read it in the Greek. And I thought at the time, boy, that's kind of harsh because we have very, very, very good translations. Uh, the Bible's been translated into nearly every language, and the scholars that translated it are very good at what they do. Of course, they are very well known, <laughs> versed in Greek and, and Hebrew. But then I got to thinking, you know, he's talking to a group of men and women that are going out into their communities and they're going to be teaching. And it's going to be their responsibility to teach with the best understanding they, they can. I started, uh, I started college at the University of Idaho in, in 1968, and I started two weeks late because I had been planning on attending Northwest Nazarene College at the time, but it couldn't raise enough money to get uh, to go there because it's very expensive. So I ended up going to the University of Idaho, and I got there two weeks late, and trying to get into the different classes there when you're two weeks late is real difficult. But one of the classes that I could get into was, was Greek, the study of Greek. And I got into a Greek history class as well. So taught by the ex-president of the university, as a matter of fact. But I was so impressed by the, the teacher that I went out and bought a Greek New Testament. And the professor said, if you want to start 
uh, in-depth study in the Greek, go to the book of John. So that's what I did. Book of John. And like I say, we have very, very good translation of the Bible. But when I started translating the Bible, just translating John, I had to look up every word in that dictionary because, you know, I only had about two or three weeks worth of the Greek. So I started looking up. And by being forced to look at every word and the meaning of every word, it, it, it made me focus on the word so much. And it's, it, it just, it was amazing. Okay, first chapter, first verse. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. If you have to ask a Jehovah Witness, what's that mean? They say, well, it means he was a God. Well, does that make any sense? I had a, a, a Jehovah Witness lady in the class, in the Greek class with me, and she asked the professor that. And the professor's name was Cecilia Ann Eaton Lushnig. Just sweet, sweet Christian lady. And uh, I found out later that she was the leading authority in the world on Euripidean uh, tragedy. And I've got several of her books at home. But she asked the professor, Dr. Lushnick, can that mean a God? And Dr. Lushnick said, no, not grammatically, not theologically, and it just flat doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. John is talking to monotheists. People believe in one God, and you can't say a God there. That means that there's more than one. So, other words in there. It says, in the beginning, was. It's the word, it's the verb, ami, which means I am. In the past tense, it's was, he was. It's in the imperfect tense, which means it's a state that has no time period, in, and was, he, he was. He was there from eternity and will be there into the future, future eternity. And it's used three times. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word with is pros, it, it literally means face to face with God, in the very presence of God. And the word was God. And in the Greek it, it reads, and, the, and God was the word. And the, the word has a definite article in front of it, the word, but it puts the emphasis on God. You don't see this in English because it, it, there's so many different words in Greek that could be translated, and whatever the, the commentator chose was what's in his thought it would come out in the translation. This one was in the beginning with God. All things through him came into existence, and the word is genata. It means came into existence. That was a point in time when there wasn't this, then it came into existence. And without him, nothing came into existence that has come into existence. And it literally says, without him, not one thing was created, basically. You, you don't see that in English. And it goes on to say, uh, unto his own things he came, and his own people did not accept him, did not understand him. 
but as many as received him, he gave them supernatural authority to become children of God. You think about that. He gave them. Exousion is the word. It literally means from out of existence. It's supernatural. It's, it's not a God-given authority, or it's not a, a human-given authority. It can only come from God. So, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it's interesting, the word dwelt is literally set up a tent. Skin was in. We get the word seen, like a scene in a, a play or whatnot. Because in the ancient times, in the Greek times, the characters changed their costumes in a tent between acts of a play. So the word God came and dwelt, set up a tent temporarily with us. For what purpose? John the Baptist is talking. And it says, He, the next day, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of mankind. What's he mean by Lamb of God? Of course, that's the physical sacrifice on the altar. A lamb was given. It had to be a spotless lamb. And Jesus came, God came to earth, and it was that sacrifice for our sin. Well, then let's turn to chapter 3. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees, Nicodemus, Nicodemus was his name, a ruler of the Jews. That one came by night to him and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are sent from God to teach. No one can do these miracles that you have done unless God is with you. Even some of the rulers in the time, in the Jews, knew that there was something special about this man. They knew that those miracles, or signs, literally, that Jesus were doing, could only be done if God was in it. And what's Jesus' response? And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you must be born again or you cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's interesting. What's the word amen mean? You know what amen means? Truly. That's the Greek word here. When, God, when Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he says, amen, amen. I didn't know that, did you? No. You must be born and every translation that I know of says again, but it's not again. It literally means, it's anothen, that means from upon high. And uh, if you have a New American Standard Bible in the, in the side notes, it'll say next to that, from above. So, because that's the literal translation. But Nicodemus is, is thinking it's again, and he says, how can this be? How can I enter again into my mother's womb a second time? And Jesus says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Born of water, of course, is physical birth. And born of the Spirit is born of the Holy Spirit. And then, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. He says, those who are born of flesh are of flesh, and those who are born of the Spirit are spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born anothen again. The Spirit, or the wind, blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from. The two words, spirit and wind, are exactly the same word as pneuma. We get pneumatic from that, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma. 
He said, you must be born of flesh and of the spirit. Nicodemus says, how, how can these things be? And Jesus says, you are a teacher of the Jews and you don't know these things. He says, if I speak to you of earthly things and you don't understand, how then can you understand if I speak to you of, of spiritual things? And he tells Nicodemus, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's referring back to Exodus, where the Israelite people had sinned against the Lord, and the Lord sent snakes, poisonous snakes, amongst them. A lot of people died. But he told Moses to form a brass serpent and hold it up and anybody that looked on that brass serpent would be saved. All I had to do was look at it. They didn't have to bow down or anything. All I had to do was look at it. That's the same way with, with Jesus. Jesus was lifted up on the cross and all we have to do is accept the fact that he died to save us from our sin. So. It goes on to say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The word here, perish, is the meaning is much, much stronger than just perish. It's apolete, apolete, or apoletai. The, the name for the destroyer is Apollyon, and that comes out in, the, in scripture, it is named Apollyon. It's from the same verb, it's exactly the same verb that the name comes from, is to be destroyed. So it's not simply perish, but be destroyed. How then, or we as, as Christians, how do we uh, understand, how do we interpret God's word? Not everybody's gonna go take Greek, you know, understand Greek. Uh, it's, it's an amazingly difficult language. There are 607 different ways to spell every verb in Greek. When it comes to tense, number, and all kinds of other uh, reasons. But every Greek word has, every regular Greek verb has 607 different ways that it's spelled. And how many Greek verbs are there? Many, 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 many verbs. How then do we as Christians, if we don't have that knowledge, what tools do we have to interpret the Bible? Hmm? Holy Spirit is the only, the first way to interpret the Bible. And without the Holy Spirit, the Bible is nothing but words. But what other ways do we have to interpret? We can interpret the Bible by the Bible. If you hear somebody say something that the Bible says, that doesn't go along with other scriptures in the Bible. If it totally contradicts something else in the Bible, well, something's wrong. Like I say, the Jehovah Witness say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. That just doesn't work. And they know scripture inside and out, but without the Holy Spirit to interpret it, it's, it's just a bunch of words. The Bible translates itself. John Wesley said, to interpret the Bible, you have to interpret the Bible by itself. The Bible, he, he claimed he was a man of one book, although he read constantly. Historical reference, 
we have a lot of uh, extra biblical accounts of, of, of Jesus. <laughs> we read a, uh, an art, well, a letter by Pliny to the emperor talking about uh, the Christians of the time and mentioning the Lord. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian that lived in Rome, talks about Jesus and says he was the son of God. He was not a man, he was the son of God. Well, Jesus was man and, and God both. And just, there's, it has been said that there's more evidence to prove that Jesus existed than to prove that Julius Caesar existed, and I believe that. We have our own experience. Like I said, I'm not a preacher. Uh, thought about it, found out, nope, just like that young man there. I think God's not telling me to go pick cotton, but he's using me in other ways. And every one of us here today is a minister of some kind. You all have spiritual gifts. And it would behoove you to find out what they are if you don't know what they are. But uh, God will use other people to help you interpret the scripture. Like I say, what shall we do? Let's turn to Luke ch chapter 24, 49. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. A lot of translations say, and you'll be endued with power from on high. Well, endued is just a translation of the Greek word for clothed. It's enduo is the Greek word for clothed. So we get endued from that. It's the same word used to describe the, the belt and the garment of a camel hair that John the Baptist wore. It's the same word that Paul uses to say, put on the full armor of God. It's clothe yourself with the full armor of God. And in the Greek, it's one word. It's not full armor, it's panoply, panoplion. And that's a, probably an archaic word, you might not know what it means. But the true meaning of the word panoply was it's the full armor of a hoplite. In the Greek army, the, their uh, strongest troops, their uh, special forces of the day were hoplites. They were the heavy infantry. And the armor that they wore, both offensive and defensive, was a panoply. All the armor of a hoplite. What's, what's our armor? The Holy Spirit, right? And Jesus told the disciples when he appeared to them after the resurrection, wait, and the word is literally set down in the city until you are uh, filled with the power from on high. And that's a different, different word for power is dunamis. We get the word dynamite from it, or dynamic. It's, it's physical power, as well as spiritual power. Of course, they did wait in Jerusalem, and at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and 3,000 people were added to the church. Does that happen today? Does that, is it the same power that affected the church in, in Jesus' time? Is that available today? Sure. I had a, I attended a, a church there in Gladstone, Oregon, 
And one of the members of the church was a, a former, well, a, was a theologian. He actually had taught at the seminary part-time. Uh, and I, I met him. And he preached one time about power of the Holy Spirit. And he said it's like a light, a light. The power is there to a light at all times. You know, the power is coming from hydroelectric dam or wherever. The power is there to the light switch. It's, and, and for, unless something is there to cut it off, that power is available. But that light won't come on until you flip the switch. How does that apply to our lives? We will never receive the Holy Spirit unless we ask for it. And that's the only way we're going to receive it is ask for it. I said before that I had a, a difficult time preaching, and boy, I used to just stutter and mumble and grumble. And I was asked to preach by a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine at a Baptist church in, in uh, Spokane. And there was about five people in the, in the congregation there. He was a tremendous, tremendous pastor, but he was having trouble. He asked me to come and preach. I don't know why, <laughs> I'm not a preacher. But I got up and I started to, to preach and I stuttered and I mumbled and I sweated and I shook and I thought, Lord, help me. Boy, I was, at that time, just a calmness came over me. And the words just flowed. And I, I could finish the sermon. I don't know what <laughs> what good it did, but at least the Lord was with me, and He uh, gave the the power to continue. I just ask today that if, if you haven't felt that power, that you ask for it. I have no. Most of you here have felt that power at one time. But if you haven't, seek it out because God will give it to you. Thank you. Let's uh, pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for these people that have been so patient with, with me. And I thank you for giving the words that I have given today. And just be with us as we go to our separate homes in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. I have a, I have a praise I want to share, Debbie. I forgot during praise and prayer time. <clears throat> Friday I had my granddaughter from Sandpoint come up and st spend the day with me and she brought three of her little children and we had an awesome day together and when she got ready to go home she got down as far as the M M MacArthur Lake curves you know most of you know those curves and coming at her in her lane was a semi truck that was trying to miss a motorcyclist and she says I have no idea how I got away from that truck, but the truck didn't hit her. She said, it was just God's guardian angels. And you know, he still performs miracles every day. And uh, we just need to be aware of those things that happen. Thank you, Walt. Yes. The old rugged cross. <clears throat> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I loved that old cross with a dearest and best till 